guys for being late this evening. Uh, pretty miserable weather out there and uh, also some family issues. So I'm glad I finally made it. And then it took a little while to figure out how we were going to project this. It's not ideal, but this program is more about what we're going to talk about rather than the pictures. But I'd, at least you'll have a picture or two of the plants that are going up for raffle here. So. But I always like to start, first of all, why divide perennials at all? Most of the time, it's because they've outgrown their allotted space. They just get larger than we, maybe the label didn't tell you that it was going to take off in 10 directions and you know cover your whole yard. Uh, or maybe it's just been in a long time. Some of the things I dug tonight have been really left alone far too long. For some of these plants, sometimes you never need to divide them. But for others, after a while, sometimes the center starts to die out. And that's an indication that you know it needs to be dug up and divided. Um, in other cases, do you have a garden club plant sale? Yes. That's one of the main reasons to be digging and dividing, because you want to share and help the club you know, make some money. I'm in a club. We have a, an in-club auction every other year and a public plant sale on the other year. And it's just, uh, it's nice to be able to share homegrown plants that people aren't going to a nursery and then finding out, well, it really doesn't live very well in New England. So uh, if it's lived in your garden, I will say there are certain plants that I will show that come to a plant sale every year. And if they do, that might be an indicator that it's an overly active plant. And that uh, maybe you, I've gotten some of those from the plant sale, and sometimes I regret my decision. Uh, but I like to start off with my weapons. And it, these are really, truly my weapons. First of all, this is my number one. I love this spade. It has changed my life. <laughs> now, seriously. Um, uh, First of all, how many of you visited the garden? Was it two years ago? Or? Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, so some of you, you know, have been there before. But um, a couple of years ago, I made a poor decision and climbed on a roof to prune a tree. And I fell off. And fortunate, I mean, after eight months um, of trying, after breaking my leg in about 15 places, um, I gave up and you know, had, an had my leg amputated. And it's hard to dig with a regular shovel when you can't figure out which leg to, you know, what, are you going to push with this one? Are you going to stand on that one? So I don't, I, every year I'd go to the Boston Flower Show, and they always had a booth for the spearhead spades. And every time I'd walk by, I'd hear people saying, I have one of those. They are absolutely fantastic. And you know, the State Federation Garden Club annual meeting, I think it was the fall meeting, they had what, the guy from Spearhead Spade there selling these spades. So I bought one. Oh my god. It's just, it's just changed my life. So much so that I went, actually I bought a long one. There's, I didn't bring it in, but I have a long-handled one that's really long. And for me, that's even better. I use it in ways you should never use a shovel. <laughs> and it, it holds up under everything, using it to move rocks and cutting through things. These will you know, cut through roots or rocky soils. So I decided to go back and get one of the short ones to buy, too. And I gave the lecture at the Federation annual meeting on shade gardening. And people were coming up while I was standing in line saying, you know, what's the answer to this? And what's the answer to that? And the guy heard them asking. He said, sounds to me like you ought to be one of our representatives. <laughs> So now I have a little, I keep a little collection of these for people who, because you can order them online, but it's a little more expensive that way. So, and now they come in so many pretty colors. You've got, <laughs> you've got pink, you've got lavender, you've got lime green. Personally, I'm, I'm in, yellow is the only color I want because I leave tools all over the yard. And when I look out, I can see my yellow shovel that I neglected to bring in. They, they don't really rust, but even so, you don't want to leave your tools out so long. So, um, I, but they now come in teal. 
uh, which is the new color, and I haven't invested, but they actually come with paisley and ladybugs, and you know, they've gotten a little out of control, but you know, the colors, pardon me? Did you bring some to sell? I actually did, but I try not to, that's not what this is about, so um, you know, if, if people are so inclined, you know, I have a few in the car, but a shipment was supposed to come yes, um, Saturday, and it didn't show up, but I have a few in the car. But these really make a difference. This hosta that I'm going to divide, this is about a 20, it was one of my very first hostas. It's about a 20 year old hosta, just trying to get this thing out of the ground. If I did not have that spade, I wouldn't. And club, my club members have sent me emails like, I'll never, I mean, they just can't believe what a change it's made in their lives. So I see a lot of people shaking. How many people have a spearhead? Oh, see, you know, there's lots of, lots of people to, I, I gave a lecture to the Cohasset Garden Club and, you know, I just brought one in as part of the presentation and then someone said, well, where do I find one? I said, you can order it online. And someone else said, well, I thought you had some in your car. <laughs> so within 20 minutes, they were all gone. So I went back another day and took them all, a whole bunch more. And then about two weeks later, I got a phone call saying, we'd like you to be our guest at our annual luncheon at a very exclusive country club, but only if you'll bring spearhead spades. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's great, but another one of my favorite tools. This is a smaller uh, fork. It's not as big as, well, first of all, pitchforks, you don't want to, you don't want a pitchfork. They're curved, have skinny, therefore, guess what? Pitching hay. So, but this one is one I've had, this is a stainless steel one. This one's over 30 years old. Um, I got this as a gift from a place I worked at that was a lot like a Smith & Hawken catalog. And I, I never clean it. I, I leave it outside. It's looking a little old after 30 years, but it's stainless steel, and the, I can just go like this, and the soil comes right off. Stainless, you know, stainless, you know, is going to cost you more, but it's going to last forever. So, especially English tools, which is what this was. So, I usually, you'll see in some of the pictures I'm going to show that I put these in back to back. I have one exactly the same size that's not stainless, but the same size and you stick it into the plant and then you push back and forth and it gets the plant divided. So, uh, but finding this size is not necessarily, because I don't think Smith & Hawken exists anymore, does it? I always used to order from a Smith & Hawken catalog and, you know, actually, this is another of my favorite tools and this is a Smith & Hawken uh, tool also. I had a long-handled one, but again, I used it way, the way I shouldn't have and I broke the handle. Uh, but, you know, this is another stainless steel, and the fork is a really great way. Once you get down, I'll probably use it on some of these tonight. Um, this is one that a lot of people seem to be familiar with. This is a hoary, hoary, and I dare you to try to bend this blade. It is absolutely, incredibly strong. It's got teeth on one side. It's got a blade on the other, but not so that you'll cut yourself, but it does cut through roots. So it's really handy for digging and dividing. Where did I put my, oh. This is definitely one of my favorite tools. This is a kitchen chef's knife. And I, my father would be turning over in his grave right now because he was in the cutlery business. <laughs> and he would not like seeing that his knives are being used in the garden, although my mother is 94 and still, 94 and still gardens, but this one cuts through, you know, it just has a good angle to it, and I'm going to be using this a lot, so you don't even have to buy an expensive one. I mean, even if you, but if you have an old one around, you know, and where's the, oh, and then this is one I got, you know, one of those freebie things, you know, you walk into BJ's and they're offering a, a free knife and, you know, this helps to get into the smaller spaces. Even a dandelion digger or a screwdriver. I mean, you know, be creative and figure out what you, you can use to get things open. Of course, 
you really should always have a pruning shears for pruning, but also even cutting through some of these woodier plants. And this is a Felco. To me, this is what all the professionals use. You want one that has a scissor action, not one that has that flat anvil. It's called an anvil pruner because it just squishes the stems on one side. And a stem that's squished is much more susceptible to diseases and water getting in. So you always want one that cuts like a scissor. Uh, these are expensive. And since I leave them, oh, I found one on my compost pile about a year later. I found one in my burn pile, and boy, that one was really toast. Uh, but <laughs> actually, I didn't mean to, that wasn't intended, but I'm, I'm a little dizzy right now. Uh, but you can get replaceable blades, and you can even get a replaceable spring. And they have them in about seven different types, and some of them are, they even have ones for lefties and also for people who have, who have small hands. So it's, it's a really, it's, it's expensive, it's worth the investment. I didn't bring the holster, but you, if you, nobody wears belts anymore. But if you did, you could put it in the holster so that you didn't put it on the compost pile or in your burn pile. Um, and you know, even, even a little snippers like this, I couldn't live without this little guy. I'll use it to, uh, it's a, just a little spring, they're very inexpensive. And you know, I'll probably use it for doing a little snipping on uh, the echinacea, which is really easy to divide. And there was one other thing I was going to show you. Uh, well, can't remember now, but we'll figure it out. So we're going to look at these plants based on the fact that different plants have different root systems. So when you dig something up, you know, you really should explore the root system. So let me find my clicker. I'm really having trouble navigating today. There it is. So we're going to start off. Uh -oh. Come on. Oh, it does help if you put batteries in it. I had to get a new one because I left one at a program a couple of a week or so ago. And couldn't get back to get it. Hopefully I have the batteries here somewhere. There we go. So anyone have any questions on the tools before I move on here? It makes, uh, yes. Could you just say the name of that pruning shears again, please? Felco, F-E-L-C-O. I should have written that in the handout. I, read, I have a program called Get Ready for Spring, and I put the name, you know, the brands of some of the tools that I really like. But uh, Felco, uh, they're going to set you back about 50 bucks. But I really think they're worth it. I've, you know, Amazon's one of the places you can you know, buy them. We sell them at the nursery I work at. But they're, as I said, they're what most professionals turn to for a really a really good cut, and they seem, I have never replaced a blade uh, because they just never seem to go, you know, and I've never sharpened, you should, you should sharpen once in a while, but I never get around to it. So I think, I don't, I don't know whether I dare say that I think the snow is over, yeah. uh, but thank goodness today wasn't snow. Yeah. Down on the South Shore, the pouring rain has been going since about 1 o'clock this afternoon. And all the roads from the South Shore uh, were completely flooded. Some of them were closed off. It was so extreme. So, But I think winter is finally over, and we can welcome spring. Uh, personally, I'm anti-Forsythia, mainly because I think it's a thug. <laughs> yeah. It, it does. It ta I mean, you know, if I hate. Please don't prune them into Q-tips. I really hate going by places where they've made them into little Q-tips or little meatballs. Uh, but, you know, they do sucker. I mean, I admit this one's probably 25 years old, but they sucker. But I love to see it have the pretty arching branches. The only problem is as soon as it hits the ground, it roots in. And you've got a new shrub, and it just keeps jumping and jumping, and it never knows when to stop. So uh, the best thing you can do for them is, you know, periodically you should cut all the old trunks right down to the ground and get rid of them. 
And that will generate new growth that will flower better and look prettier, and they'll be a little more upright to start with anyway. But uh, with the coming of spring, you know, we're all going out now probably to see what's coming up. I have a lot of things in bloom already, not just trees and shrubs, but all my blood roots have been blooming this week. They only bloom for five minutes, but they say they're spring. Uh, but start looking at what, what might, evaluating what you think might need division or what you want to donate to the plant sales. And when you're thinking about it, diff as I said, there are different root systems for different plants. So primroses are one that you can dig up a bit of a plant and you can just take your fingers and pull it apart. Those are the ones I like. They're really easy. I've got two of them here tonight that you don't have to do anything but just pull them apart with your fingers. That makes it easy. Uh, Lamium's another one. It's a ground cover for the shade, but it, it can get to be a nuisance. It spreads a lot, but I just yank it out of the ground, I pull it apart, and I you know, put it back down. So it's a very easy one to take to a plant sale, and the nice thing is it's reasonably evergreen, so that even if we have a late spring, it still looks pretty good uh, for the plant sale. And we all know that the first things that sell at the plant sale are the ones that have flowers on them. And sometimes, this often has flowers on it by the time you hold your plant sale, so um, that's an, another one. This shows up at our Garden Club plant sale every single year. Some people call it evening primrose. It isn't theoretically evening. It's in the family of evening primrose, but evening primrose is a, a native biennial. So it, it's foliage one year, it blooms the next year, and the, the uh, goldfinches absolutely love it for the seeds. Uh, this is a perennial member of that family that is usually called sundrops, mainly because evening primrose, guess what, blooms in the evening. And sundrops bloom during the day. So they're in the same family, but this would be sundrops because it blooms during the day. But this spreads and spreads, and it shows up at, I, it's shown up at our plant sale. I've been in my club for 40 years, and I swear it's been in a plant sale every single year. So uh, if you have a little, but it's easy to pull apart. You almost don't have to use any kind of equipment, or you can just go in with you know, a shovel or even a trowel and just dig up a clump of it, pot it up, and take it to the plant sale. Shasta daisies, they're a little bit more of a rhizome, and they really should be divided every few years because they tend to grow over each other, and eventually those roots aren't reaching the ground anymore, and I find mine just die off if I don't transplant them once in a while. So if they're starting to look a little raggedy or missing, don't be afraid to dig them up right now. Rule of thumb is if it blooms in the spring, transplant in the fall. If it blooms in the fall, transplant in the spring. And if it blooms somewhere in between, you can usually get away with either time, but I will show specific plants that have preferred times that they like to be moved. But that's a rule of thumb, um, because if you dig up the spring bloomers now, you could potentially interrupt their bloom season. You know, they, they might not bloom for you this year if you do some major division on them. So that's the only negative, but of course people want to see them in bloom at the plant sale. I know at our plant sale, we started selling far more plants when we started having people bring either photographs or print out pictures of what the plants looked like when they were in bloom. And you know, if we had 15 daedalies, we were very lucky. We had a gentleman who had very expensive daedalies that donated some for us every year because he, didn't, he wanted to keep buying new ones and he provided us with pictures of every one, and we just had this great big billboard that had all the names with the variety and a picture of them. And we, we had about 140 of them, and they sold out in about, oh, well, less than about a half an hour. They were all gone because, you know, you show them pictures of what these daedalies look like and all the pretty colors, and they, you know, but, you know, not everybody who walks into your plant sale has any idea you know, what they're looking at. So a little picture goes a long way. Um, lamb's ear is another one that, you know, you can pretty much pull it out of the ground. You might need to snip it. I like to give it a little bit of a snip. I do love that. I see you pointing to that. I bought that last year. It's an annual, but oh my God, it is. Go over and pat it. You just have to pat. 
that plant. I can't even remember what it's called, but it is silk. It's like a really soft leather, or it's just, it's one of those touchy-feely plants you just have to try. But, um, you know, and I, everyone should grow lamb's ear for themselves, for their grandchildren. I pick up, you know, I walk around the yard patting a, a lamb's ear here and there. Um, then we get into some of the perennials. Um, I brought echinacea with me tonight. It's one that has taken over my yard. Um, it either loves you or it hates you. Some of the newer cultivars out there and the pretty colors, do I have another picture of all the pretty colors? They're not as sturdy or reliable as the good old pink one, which is, and when I say native, I'm talking to North America. Echinacea does not grow native in New England, but I have a patch probably 15 feet long now of all pink ones. They've killed off daedalies and everything else because they are so happy, and it's because they get total neglect. The, I mean, it's a prairie plant. It wants basically average soil, not a lot of fertilizer, not a lot of water, not a rich soil. It just wants, you know, to exist. And I leave the seed heads on for the goldfinches, and they've spread them everywhere. And they've cross-pollinated with some of the other colored ones I have. So I have little groupings. A group this big had white, pink, gold, yellow, and orange, and red all in. There were like 10 plants, and they were all different colors just pollinated all by themselves and created this little, I leave it because I want people to, it's not the way I design a garden, but I don't have time to maintain my gardens anymore anyway. <laughs> Bee balm is, is a mint, and it's a spreader. But what a great spreader. I mean, it's a New England, it's a New England native, butterflies, hummingbirds, hummingbird moths, bees, uh, so there's a little hummingbird at that one, but you know, it's, it's right on the surface, and you can just literally grab some. Uh, the hard part is putting it, you know, resettling it because it's so superficial, but this is a great plant to just allow it to run among your other plants because it doesn't kill off or, well, actually, do I have another picture of that? No, I don't. Um, I have a patch about 16 feet long, and there are about 30 varieties of hostas buried underneath it that haven't seen the light of day in a couple of years, so. Um, go, uh, gra uh, flocks, our garden flocks, also uh, U.S. and actually New England native. And this one has, again, a more fibrous root that you can just take, you know, a little clippers or, you know, a little scissors. Oh, I didn't show you my big scissors. This is also a nice big scissors. More in the fall, in the fall when you're cutting, uh, you're transplanting in the fall, which is actually my preferred time. Uh, the daedalies and the um, Siberian iris, you're gonna wanna cut back the foliage by half because you want the energy to go into new roots, not in trying to maintain foliage that's this tall in the fall. So that's, I, I think I might have pictures of that. Here's another thug as far as I'm concerned. I know a lot of people love their black-eyed Susans. Um, every time I see one in my yard, I pull it up and throw it on the compost pile. I just, you know, I don't know. I just, I'm not a fan of that color gold, but I do love this one. This is called Rubeckia nidida herbston. Summer sun, it grows five to seven feet tall. Um, it has very pretty, shiny green foliage. Uh, the flowers are more of, I won't say lemon yellow, but not a, a gold. And it blooms from July to frost whereas black-eyed Susans have a somewhat limited bloom span. So, and that has these neat seed heads that the chickadees and the tufted titmice love. So, and if you put it in full sun, it never needs staking. So I have a piece, I have a little, doesn't look like much right now, but this is it. It spreads, but at least in my yard, it just spreads a little here and there. It's not like black-eyed Susans that to me just don't stop growing. Oh, there's a picture of it, the flowers. Uh, so it's a, a lighter yellow and it has a green cone instead of the, the black or brown cone. And there it is at my front door. So that year it grew really tall, but I never have to stake it as long as it's in full sun. And just average soil, no major needs. Most of your rubecchias are like that. Um, 
for the fall, you have your New England asters, which again get kind of woody and can kind of die out. So, um, and again, this would be the best time to move things like sedums or divide sedums or New England asters or anything that's blooming later in the summer um, if you're only doing it for yourself. And then there's some things you just have to do because they've just gotten too big. This one's another seven footer and it doesn't start blooming until end of October and it blooms right till Thanksgiving. Um, it's called Aster Tetericus. It is not a native. Um, Alan Armitage says the good thing about it is it spreads. The bad thing about it is it spreads. Uh, but it's pretty easy to get up. And uh, I, it, it blooms at a time right next to a Bonica rose, a pretty pink rose that I have, a, a shrub rose. Combination's really nice. And I mentioned the sedums. Um, everyone grows sedum autumn joy. Right now they look like little Brussels sprouts. And they have almost no root system at all at this time of the year. You can just take your fingers and pull them up. Um, I brought Angelina with me tonight, and I think I forgot to add a picture. Angelina is this little, it has wonderful texture to it. It's just this little ground cover that I have patches, you know, this, this wide. It's lemon yellow in the summer. It's lime green in the spring. It even gets a reddish tint to it in the fall, and it is 100% evergreen. It keeps its foliage all winter long. So I have a great picture of it in January when it still ha it's got a little frost on each of those little, and it's a great textural plant. So it's a great front of the border because it only grows about this tall. But it's nice to have something evergreen out in your garden that gives you that texture and color. Sedum Angelina. Daedalus, I did have a bit of a, an addiction to daedalus. Um, at one point, I was up to 800 cultivars. Um, and I have been known to spend as much as $250 on one plant. Um, but do we, I, over the years, we moved in 40 years ago, and it was a, an acre and a half of full sun. And then I started adding all those cute little blue spruces, magnolias, dogwoods. Do we all know what happens after 42 years of plant? I went from an acre and a half of full sun to having mostly shade, so I'm up to about 300 varieties of hosta now. So the daedalus have started kind of petering out because again, 25 years of no division, they're just not reach, the roots aren't reaching the soil and they're just disappearing. Even the ones I spent $250, they're gone. So, um, you know, just, just, you know, every three to four years, and it depends on the variety. Some, except for the orange roadside thug, and that is really a thug. I get calls all the time, why did my beautiful pink daedalus turn orange? That cannot happen. Daedalus do not change color. If they're pink, they will always be pink. Maybe a slightly different shade of pink depending on moisture, but the orange daedalus sends out stolons from here all the way to there, really sneaky with nothing in between, and sprout up, and it's so vigorous it kills off your, you know, hybrid daedalus. So, and will crowd out other things. It's wonderful in woods, you know, along stream banks, but be careful in the garden because I never planted it and it started popping up. So. Um, and daedalus, I mean, there are 76,000 registered varieties of daedalus now. So just know that they're out there. That's still a Dioro, and then there's happy returns. You really need to divide those regularly because they like abuse. If you just don't, they won't rebloom. So the more you dig, divide them, and move them around, the more they will bloom. Daedalus also love moisture. I mean, they are drought tolerant. There's a big difference between drought tolerant and liking to be dry. They will survive even if you have no rain, but they're going to bloom better and longer and have more flowers if you give them water, water, and more water. So daedalus really do like water. So here's the thing I was talking about with my pitchforks. Now this is a big old clump of daedalus, and you just stick the pitchforks in back to back. Let's see if I have another picture. But what I prefer to do is I like to dig up an entire clump. 
It's really much better to just dig up the whole clump. I lay a big tarp on my driveway. I literally pick it up, throw it in the air, and let it fall down. On, because what makes them hard to divide is all that soil in the roots. So I, I do that a couple of times, throw it up in the air. Then I grab it by the hair, and I beat it. <laughs> and that gets all the soil out. You might break a couple roots. But then half of them you can just pull apart with your fingers. Otherwise, I think the one I brought today, oh, the one I brought today isn't too bad, but there's some that you just can't, it's, they're more like the hosta, which is going to take a sharp knife to get through them. So, you know, get as much of the soil out as you can, and then, you know, put the pitch, you know, if you've got a clump this big of an old one, put the pitchforks in back to back. I didn't bring the second pitchfork, it's just too much to carry, but just put them in back to back, and you just start doing this. And all of a sudden, they just seem to come apart, especially if you get some of the soil out. And then if the clump is too big, you do it again to a smaller piece. And you, you'd be amazed how much easier it makes them come apart so that you can just do it with your hands. Um, so here I've divided it into two with my two matching but different materials. And then I would probably put the pitchfork in, pitchforks in again back to back and do the same process. And it really speeds up and is much less frustrating. Um, what you really don't want to do, but I did it with the hosta because I had no choice, you can take your spade and you can just, but then you're cutting off all the roots on one side of the plant. And if you get all the soil out, you can pull it apart so the roots on all sides of the plant are coming out. It's much less traumatic. I mean, well, I won't go into personal things, but you know, it's, it's less traumatic to the plant if you, you try to leave as many of the roots on. It's going to reestablish much more rapidly. And if it is the fall, you know, you really should give it a haircut. So, because again, you don't want all that energy going into tall foliage. You want it to go into making new roots. So uh, that's when you're, you sell them as part of a daily society, you have to wash all the roots to make sure we're, you're not passing along any bad guys to uh, you know, know how many times have you bought things at plant sales and unusual little things suddenly show up in your garden and you don't know. They probably you know, were latent in the soil or hadn't sprouted yet or just one little piece was left behind. That's how I ended up with about 10 of my worst invasive plants in my yard. So just know that you know, but for plant sales, you, you know, that's the way it is. You take that risk. Investigate when you buy them. If you're not dividing them, but um, did, did you say you should still cut them down? If you're doing it in the fall, just if you're moving them. If you're not, if you're, if you're not dividing, there's... Just leave the greens. I leave the greens, and then when they turn totally brown in the fall, I do remove them. This year, I went with the new philosophy. I'm very active in a group called Grow Native Massachusetts. And the philosophy, um, every lecture I've heard on pollinators and good bugs and things like that is you should leave all of that debris on for the winter. The problem is with all my hostas and all my daedalies and all my Siberian irises, and I'm seeing, the, I'm seeing the toll already, the voles have a field day. And the voles you know, just eat the roots of the plants when you have the debris on. What I usually prefer to do is clean up the gardens in the fall, shred all my leaves, and then after killing frost, put the shredded leaves back on, because usually by then the voles have found a home. But um, that's the philosophy, and I, I, there's tunnels everywhere. In my, it's too early to determine how bad it is. but. Uh, that's the philosophy, and I am really into pollinators, so um, I'm trying to be a good girl. Now, hostas, again, I much prefer fall division. I usually do it in August. If you do them now, a lot of times, one of the things I love about hostas is their symmetry. And if you do it in the spring, sometimes you, you know, and you cut out a big piece, sometimes you lose that, you know, really nice symmetry. And sometimes you kind of set them back a little bit, especially if you're dividing a really large hosta, because very large hostas can take up to three to four years to reach their ultimate size. So if you buy them at a garden center, and you've got a, what's supposed to be a, you know, one of these monster hostas, 
and it looks about that big, it's going to take it three or four years to reach that adult size. So if you divide them in the spring, you're basically doing the same thing. You're setting them back as much as two to three years. But if you divide them in the fall, you actually almost gain a year by you know, getting them back in the ground in the fall and they reestablish roots in the next spring. They might be a little bit dwarfed, but not really scrawny and little, which they can be if you do them now. So, but there's no question it's a lot easier to divide them when you can see those little noses. And you know, with the hostas or the daedalies, I recommend taking one of these knives. You really don't want to, again, sever the whole thing. You want to go through what's called the crown. So you just want to cut where the roots meet the green part. You want to just cut through that part and then try to pull it apart so that you're saving the roots on all sides of the plant. So I should be able to demonstrate that with the plants I dug. How many would you divide that one into? Well, you know, I say that you should have no less than two. If it's a nice big one, leave three to four divisions together. Never cut hostas or daedalies down to one single piece each. You know, especially daedalies, they now, I worked at a, a, a farm in Rehoboth that so, still sells up to 4,000 varieties of daedalies. And it's instant gratification. You can go there in July and say, ooh, I like that one, that one, that one, and that one. They dig them up bare root. You take them home bare root, you plop them back in the ground, and the flowers only last a couple days, but you know, you're actually seeing what you're getting. But they used to, when we used to line them out, we would do individual, you know, single, what's called a single fan. And it took them like three years to really look like anything and grow a flower. They started do, leaving two to three divisions intact, not putting three separate ones, but actually leaving two, two or three connected. And they always bloom the next year. So I would say try to leave two to three minimum divisions intact when you divide them. So when I divide the daedalee tonight, I'm going to just probably split it in half. And that way, uh, they're going to be two to three divisions for the so people. So if you do a bigger clump, like if you were to divide that into four. I mean, again, I would take three or four. Division. Pardon me? If you were to divide that into right. four, that's a pretty large. Oh, no, you could do that a lot more. Just try to have, you know, three noses. Right, but if you were to do it into four, it's not going to thrive as well because it's still fairly compact. Oh, hostas never need to be divided. They're the one plant that, but, but the, the only thing about it, though, is the, <laughs> because they're son of a guns when they get old, the only thing about it is I think the leaves start to get smaller uh, when they're so crowded in together. So like this blue cadet that I'm going to divide today used to have, a, and even the picture I have of it shows a, a larger leaf. And now it's smaller because you know, it's competing and it's all tight. But I have a friend who's in the hosta society that never divides any of his hostas. And I don't because I don't have time. But um, the hostas don't. Other plants like the daedalies will stop blooming. The foliage will get, that's usually an indicator. If the plant stops blooming, or the foliage gets smaller and smaller, or the flowers get smaller and smaller, or you have that big hole in the middle, that tells you, please divide me, and I'll be much happier. So, and I used to think hostas were the ugliest plants on earth. I mean, you know, those green and white plants that people put all the way along their driveways, they've really come a long way. Uh, lots of variety in colors and uh, forms and shapes. Um, this is one of the most popular hostas in the country called June. Um, and June is not only pretty, but one of the reasons I'm showing it is a hosta can just be hanging out, growing, and all the leaves look alike, and all of a sudden there's a, a little plant in it that looks totally different. It's called a sport. And it's not a seedling. It's just the hosta decided to be something different. And a very large percentage of the most popular hostas today just happened accidentally. And the person cut out that piece and grew it along, and it became a new variety. 
And June is one of those. June was a sport of a, a variety called halcyon. And uh, what can happen is that suddenly, this is June in the fall. It looks quite a bit different in the fall. All of a sudden, some of the leaves start turning all one color. It is reverted back to its parent. That is halcyon that it came from originally. Halcyon is a much more vigorous plant than the variegated June. And what will happen eventually is June will disappear and all you'll have is halcyon left. It takes over. So a, a green and white variegated hosta, if you start seeing all green leaves, you better cut them out or you're going to end up with an all green hosta. It's just going to disappear. So I go in with a very sharp knife and I just, it's really just a single plant, but if it starts to multiply, then it might be, I just cut it out. And sometimes it, I have to do that a couple of times, but sometimes I get that one piece out and it stays June. But if you see, but you might find something brand new that's really exciting. And as I said, you might want to, you know, check out hosta people and find out if maybe you've formed a new variety. But um, so you want to get rid, that's the good guy. These, all these blue leaves are, Halcyon's a beautiful blue hosta that I also grow, but June is much more popular. So I went in, oh, I guess that just shows you the plant, but those are the blue leaves and there are some variegated leaves there. So I went in with my chef's knife and, you know, cut through and got out all the pieces that were variegated and just, you know, two different clumps. So I had June and Halcyon. Um, and uh, another plant that I'm trying to show different root systems, this is Solomon seal, and it's a rhizome. And boy, the variegated one, you have a little, ooh. I've got, you know, probably, probably the width of this, you know, it really spreads. This is a variegated one that's a shorter. This is our native one. This is a Japanese one. The variegated one is just huge in my yard. So anyone who doesn't mind that, there's a piece he here tonight to share. Um, bearded iris, I did not bring bearded iris. Bearded iris are best moved in August. That is the time to do the bearded iris. You want to let them bloom this spring. Um, no matter how well you take care of them, you're not doing anything wrong. In July and August, they're going to look really crappy. <laughs> I mean, the foliage turns brown and streaked and spotted, and they just look ugly. So that's the time to divide them, because you want to do that but early enough. I had to do some really late this uh, fall, and they've all heaved out of the ground. Because they have such a superficial root system, you want to get them done in August so that they reestablish their root system before bad weather sets in. So these are the dwarfs. I'm, I used to, I, that was my first addiction. I had about 125 of them. And they were just too high maintenance between borers and you know having to divide them. But I started buying new ones in the last two years because they're just so pretty. Yeah, there are a lot of the. Old, old yep. It's been there for 50 some odd years. Uh, I actually went to Tony Abram and started them, and they've been in his yard. They're selling, so I'm going to take those. And I do. I mean, especially the dwarfs. The dwarfs almost always bloom at the time of our plant sale. And again, a, a plant in bloom is going to sell instantaneous. You can do it, it's just not going to be ideal. And it's better to do it when, you know, they're, but if you're doing them for a plant sale, by all means, I would. No. <laughs> but they seem to be surface, yeah. right? Well, they are. I mean, that's, um, I guess I, I'm not sure I have a picture of it, but that's, that's, those, that's the way iris rhizomes look. They stay right on the surface. You don't want to bury the rhizome. You want the top of it to always be exposed to full sun. If you bury them too deeply, they usually rot. Uh, so it's important that that actually stays above uh, the, the soil. And e you shouldn't even mulch them. And how do I find the names of them? Oh, it, it, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of varieties. So nice. Almost all iris have a very strong scent to them. I have my other ones, but I don't know what scent. Oh, I'm almost, maybe it's, 
Daedalus lost a lot of their scent through hybridization. It's possible that the newer iris have too. You either love it or you hate it. So do you cut that foliage? Well, down? we're going to get to that. So these are what they look like bare root. Um, all of this, I mean, those little nubs are new growth, but it's not really worth it. I just take my, I use this most of the time. I just cut off that old part right there, and I cut off this old part there. Iris grow from the back. So you can see the new growth is going backwards, and all of this is essentially useless. It's not worth saving unless you really love it a lot and you want to save these little nubby things, but they're going to take a couple of years to look like anything. So here they are all trimmed up. And I cut off all those old parts, um, gave them a haircut because I did it in August because, again, you want it to go into the roots. The hard thing is they want to grow this way, the roots. But if you try to plant them that way, they immediately flop over. So what I recommend is making a hole, making a little mountain of soil, in the middle of your hole, putting the rhizome at the top of the mountain and spreading the roots down the side of the mountain, backfill. It establishes and the new roots come out at surface level, but you've anchored it so it doesn't just flop over. Isn't that the same way you plant day lilies? Day lilies, I, I tend to do the same way to anchor the roots, but also remember they're growing from the back. The tendency is that people place them that one going that way, that way, that way. And in five minutes, they now have a hole in the middle again. So you need to face them going different directions when you're replanting them so that you're forming a clump instead of just creating a new hole in the middle. So I, I love them, um, but you know the day that they bloom that you'll have 50 mile an hour winds, uh, especially if they're the really tall ones. Um, so I love Siberians. And Siberians have come a long way from just the little purple and white plants, and their foliage looks perfect all summer long. They get kind of woody. Uh, they now come in lots of different colors. They aren't just you know purple. There's really pretty maroon ones. There are yellow ones. Uh, but the roots are really woody. Um, and all of this old part, that's, that's useless. It's dead. So you want to dig them up, and they are one that really can get a hole in the middle. And they're not easy to dig up, so I brought one with me tonight. But uh, this, all of that, you just want to cut it off. It is never going to grow any new foliage or flowers. So dig it up, cut off those old parts, because they also grow towards the back. And you'll see at this point right now little nubs coming up on them. Well, actually, this one's come a little bit farther along. But there are a lot of dead roots on here that we're just going to hack off because they're unproductive. And it's good to do that every couple of years. The most important thing with Siberian and Japanese iris is you never want the roots to dry out while you're waiting to transplant them. Daylilies, I'll leave them next to the garage for a month, and they're still fine, and they're alive. But the Siberians, when we were digging the place I mentioned in Rehoboth that has 4,000 varieties of uh, daylilies, also has a couple hundred varieties of Japanese and Siberian iris. And when we used to transplant them, we left the soil on them till we actually divided them. And as soon as they were divided, the divisions went in a bucket of water. Uh, you don't want to leave them in a bucket of water for too long, but you don't want them to dry out in the meantime. And when we ship them, we wrap them in moist newspaper. So it's really important not to let. And when you plant them, make sure you water them you know, consistently until they establish. Peonies. Really, the only time to divide them is in the fall. They really don't like to be uh, divided at any time. They never have to be divided. Houses burn down, peonies, there's nothing left but a chimney, and those peonies keep on coming up. <laughs> I mean, they will live over 100 years. They are really, really long-lived. This is a Festiva Maxima that's been around since 1924. And it's just, you know, but they're so beautiful. The problem is the day that all these big double peonies bloom, you will have torrential downpours, <laughs> and they will all end up lying in the mud. So just do yourself a favor. Invest in some peony hoops. They're double rings with three legs. My mother gave me some 40 years ago. They're all rusty. I never take them out of the ground. 
you never even notice them once the foliage comes up. So uh, do yourself, but fall, I actually do them usually in October. Um, other thing that's really, oh, so here's, that's what they look like. They look like a bunch of tree roots. And these little red eyes are next year's foliage and flowers. And the planting depth on those little red eyes is critical. If you, I think because they look like tree roots, you want to plant them deeply. If that's more than two inches below the surface, they're not going to bloom. They may send up foliage, but they're never going to bloom. Also, if they start getting too much shade, that's really the only reason you ever need to move them is whether you want to share them or they're getting too shady and they're not blooming anymore. Otherwise, you never have to move, divide them. But if you want to, you know, make sure that that's only about one to two inches below the surface of the soil. And then you have to be careful if you're cleaning up your gardens in the spring because sometimes those little red eyes are right on the surface and you rake and you break them. Oh, it breaks my heart. When every time I rake one and break it, it drives me crazy. But, you know, they just, they're just a great perennial. Ornamental grasses, first of all, make sure you give them plenty of space if you're going to grow them. And you will need a machete, a backhoe um, to get them out. The only time to divide those is in the spring. If you divide them or try to transplant them in the fall, they do not make any new roots in the fall. And they'll just die over the winter. So now is the time. If you're going to do one, you know, my husband bought me a sawzall. That's an electric saw. You know, and that actually has worked pretty well. But actually, my, on some of them, my spearhead spade has actually gone through the root system. But that, this is the time to do those. I've been cutting mine back, and I'm going to try to dig up a really old clump. But they're challenging. Just a few that are tough to divide. Old-fashioned bleeding heart has very brittle roots. You try to divide it, and just kind of disintegrates. Um, anyone into botanical names? Anyone use them? Anyone know the botanical name of Old Fashioned Bleeding Heart? No? It's called, used to be called Dicentra. Not anymore. They changed the botanical name. It is now called Lamprocapnos. And people say, why? If you think about the, old, uh, the Fringe Bleeding Heart, which is a Native American plant, Old Fashioned Bleeding Heart tends to go dormant in the middle of the summer. The only thing they actually have in common is they have heart-shaped flowers. DNA has proven they have absolutely no relationship whatsoever. And the reason they are changing botanical names like bugbane, which used to be simicifuga and is now actea, is because DNA proves they have no relationship. And that maybe, and the bugbane or the um, simicifuga looks exactly foliage-like and genetically like something called red baneberry or doll's eyes, two very short spring blooming uh, perennials. So that's why they change names. People always ask, so I just thought I'd throw that in there. Poppies are very challenging to divide. They have a deep tap root. Most of your tap rooted plants are buggers to try to divide uh, because their roots go so long. But think about it, they are always the most drought tolerant plants you can grow because their roots go deep into the soil. So they really do well during drought. So poppies, baptisia, this is another one that'll live 100 years. But when they get mature, they, they look like giant uh, parsnips. And they go way down. And apparently, if you don't get the whole root, you kill it. So I haven't tried. I've got one that's about eight feet wide that I may try this year. but. Um, and they come lot, in lots of colors now, um, called false indigo. But now they come in pink and white and yellow. And I, the one I have that's eight feet wide is called screaming yellow. And it is screaming yellow. Um, butterfly weed is also a tap-rooted plant. It's not as bad as some of the others because it's a little bit more diminutive in size. But it does have a deep tap root. If you grow it. Make sure you mark it if you're not familiar with it, because it comes up really, really late. And it's very easy to forget where it is or what it is. So that's, it's seeded all over my gardens. And it's a great pollinator plant for the monarchs, as well as the butterflies and the bees. Balloon flower, also tap-rooted. Woody herbs, things like Russian sage or lavender, 
they're more of a shrub than they are, you know, you can't divide them. You know, it's like trying to divide, you know, um, I don't know, a rose bush or something. They're just really woody. You're better off just buying another plant or, you know, just, they just don't, and yucca is another one that has a tap root that goes to China. Um, <laughs> monk's hood, it looks like a delphinium on steroids. Um, you know, people always go, oh, that's poisonous. I would never grow that. But no one thinks twice about growing digitalis, foxgloves. Yeah. That's heart medicine. Everybody grows foxgloves, but some reason they don't. My friend Carrie Mendez says, unless your children or your grandchildren are ground feeders, <laughs> you, you really shouldn't have to worry about it because animals are a lot smarter than people. They, they tend to stay away from toxic plants. Not all, not all. I, kn I know there are dogs and cats that don't mind their business, but um, that's, it's a, that doesn't bloom until October. And it stands this tall, and it's, it's got a del whole thing looks like a delphinium, except the leaves are thick and glossy, and it comes back every year. Whereas delphiniums, to me, are expensive annuals. I don't buy them anymore. So just very quickly, these are a couple of the plants that I'm going to be dividing. This is the little Siberian iris. Uh, it's a very unique color. It's called summer sky. And um, I've had it 30 years, but it's very unique color. And you know, Siberians are pretty easy. Sun, part shade, moist, don't like it really dry. That's the only thing. Uh, but this doesn't really do it justice, but it's been in my garden for a long time. The flower is small, but we grow a lot of things that only have flowers that big, and we think those are pretty. When I look out my window when that's in bloom, it just, it's just such a unique color. So that's with us tonight. This is the hosta I was saying. That's blue cadet. Has very much of a blue tint to it. If you didn't know, blue color in hostas is actually a wax layer that sits on the top of the leaf. And if you take your finger and you rub the leaf, you can, it'll turn green because you're rubbing off that wax layer. So if you grow blue hostas in the sun, the sun melts the wax and the hosta turns green. So the more you can grow a blue hosta in shade, the bluer it's going to be. By the end of the summer, almost all blue hostas have turned green. But even rain is wearing off you know, the surface, but that, that blue color is solely the responsible because of this wax layer that sits on top of the leaf. So if you have a blue hosta, when it comes up, rub the leaf and you'll see you've left a green thumb, thumbprint on the hosta leaf. So blue cadet is what I would call a, a small to medium hosta. It only grows about this tall. And I've had it for ages. Even the deer don't seem to eat it. And I have a lot of deer. Um, and this is the daedaly that we're dividing tonight. Uh, it's a very deep burgundy. They say it's a deep red. To me, this is, I don't even know what color to call that, but it's called Serena Dark Horse. And <laughs> it's just different. And I brought it because I've had it many, many years, and I'm hoping that the label was in the right places. It's, it's amazing what happens to labels in the winter. Um, and. That's the label. It had a metal label in it saying Serena Dark Horse, but you might have a surprise. I can guarantee whatever it is, it's um, a cultivar that I probably paid anywhere from $20 to $75 for. Echinacea. Um, I did bring some echinacea. It is pink. Uh, just one, well, I'll show it when I divide it. So whether you garden on a small scale, like my little reject garden at the end of my driveway, <laughs> or a large scale, this is not my yard. <laughs> Anyone been to um, Coastal Maine Botanical Garden? If you haven't, you need to go. It is absolutely amazing. It's in Booth Bay Harbor. It is only 11 years old. It is already listed in the top 10 in the country. And it is it's just acre after acre after. The guy, Bill Kalina, that used to be at Garden in the Woods is now the director up there. I, I go every August. I know people that go at other times. That's when I finally get away. But it is 
I go to botanical gardens all over the country, and this is still one of my two favorites. So it is absolutely, it takes me from, well, see, you guys are already a little closer. Living on the South Shore, it takes me three hours and three hours and 20 minutes to get there. I go up in the morning, I spend nine hours there, and I drive home in the evening. But it is truly amazing. Yeah. I like to go in August, yeah. and I could show you oodles of pictures. I do a program on public gardens, and I have, and everybody goes, oh, oh. you know, it's just, <laughs> it is just that beautiful. You just can't believe. But this is just this, just one. I mean, Russian sage. I mean, oh, uh, it, <clears throat> the Missouri Botanical Garden. Oh, oh, I that is, I I went to a hosta. I, the only reason I went to the hosta convention was it was in St. Louis. And my number one go-to looking for information on perennials is the Missouri Botanical Garden web. Uh, you know, when you Google a plant, if you see Missouri Botanical Garden, that is going to give you by far the best information on that plant. Tells you whether it's native, where it grows, you know, what it's, it's just, their descriptions are just absolute. So I always wanted to see them. And I went there for the Hosta Convention. I would say it was 105 degrees the day we went there. And we spent six hours there, and it was very different than coastal Maine. I also think Tower Hill is one of the, that's probably my third favorite. Um, and no bad season to go to Tower Hill Botanical Garden. Even in the middle of the winter, it's awesome. And that's got to be fairly close by for you guys. Yeah, oh, aren't you lucky? It takes me about an hour, and I'm probably there, you know, 10 to 12 times a year because the Daily Society meets there and the Hosta Society meets there, and it's just beautiful in all seasons. So I hope you'll all have time this spring to enjoy your gardens, and now we're gonna get down and dirty. Anyone have any questions before I babble on about my plants? I'm gonna put this someplace safe so I don't lose it, because I left it somewhere last month. So, first of all, I always wear gloves. Partly because I used to work full-time at Macy's and they didn't really like me coming in with grubby fingers. Um, and, you know, it's just, there's things in the soil, especially now that we're reading about, you know, Roundup and all the stuff like that. I just think it's better to, you know, wear gloves. Also, you know, I was told by a nurse that I should always have one on this hand because I had a mastectomy many years ago and there's no lymph nodes left in this arm, so. You know, if you've had that surgery, you might want to also think about making sure you wear it. So we're going to talk about, who should I cut up first? Grab my weapons. They really are, though, in a way. Um, you know, actually, no one really needs to see the, see the pictures anymore, right? I'll just... Uh, it is plugged in, that would be the only problem. I probably should turn it off, so. Well, I guess it turns off when it's closed. We'll just move that up here. No one has any questions? I answered everything you ever thought about. <coughs> That's all right, we'll just toss them there. Get my projector. I, you can do those at either time. Again, I think you might affect, actually I can disconnect that. You might affect its bloom if you move it in the spring, but you can move them now. Um, if you do it in the fall, you always want to wait until September at the earliest to divide. We used to divide them as late as November. So if you are going to divide the Siberians, you can do spring or fall. The bearded iris are the ones that are a little bit more tricky. That can go in the brown bag, if you don't mind. So why don't we start with the Siberian? So again, this is an older variety. It's been in the ground. I don't believe that I have ever divided it. Um, and so it's gotten pretty woody. 
And usually what I'd try to do is I start off with my clippers, because you'd be surprised how woody some of these are that you can't just pull them apart. You can see a piece that broke there. So this is, there is a little bit of green on here. I don't think it's worth it. You have to learn to be, I used to save every little piece of every single little plant and I'd pot them up for plant sales and half the time they didn't make it so, you know, I'm, I'm getting better. I am a hoarder, I won't deny it. Anyone who's been to my garden, the joke is, and clubs that have been there and I see them at meetings or something, they'll say, how's the driveway collection? Yeah. <laughs> because you, you, you come into my driveway and there's usually somewhere in the vicinity of 100 to 150 plants in pots waiting to go into the ground. I guess when, when I have, you know, when you're splitting stuff and something breaks off and then I feel so bad, I have a section in the back and I call it the orphanage. <laughs> well, and that's what I say about my driveway collection, my orphans in the driveway. Then at this time of the year, my entire side of the garage is filled with the plants, some of them have been in and out for six or seven years. <laughs> and it's just, you know, the, the space is there, but the time to do it isn't. Uh, but that's always the, the joke is, you know, how's the driveway collection? And a lot of the clubs that come, they get in the driveway and the first 45 minutes to an hour is spent looking at all the unusual plants in the driveway. But it's, it's an addiction. I tell my husband I could have worse vices, but he's a non-gardener, so it's kind of hard to <laughs> convince him that that's the case. So again, I really want to leave at least, you know, little clumps all together. And this end's sort of kind of bare, but I don't want to dispose of it completely. So ideally, actually, where did I put my... I'm going to grab this. I don't want to get soil all over everything. Now this is the one I said that if you're not going to plant it right away, you should get it, you know, keep it in a plastic bag to keep it moist, but if it's going to be even longer, maybe put it in a bucket, but maybe not for too long. You could do this with a knife, because it's not really very good for my clippers. So I'm going to try to leave. It may be too hard for the knife even. Yeah, this one's going to be better with the clippers. Then you try to get through some of it, and then this one I think is better just cut all the way through. Then you're giving it a clean cut. So you've left all these little ends on it, but there's lots there's still lots of roots. This should have absolutely no problem reestablishing. I think that may be the root of a hosta. <laughs> See, I can tell that that's a different, you know, when you get to know the plants well enough, and this did have a big hosta growing in the middle of it. So, and I don't even know whether it's a, a seedling or a, a named variety. As a matter of fact, that's a hosta root too. Yeah, so I'm just, I like to get some of the soil off, but with the uh, Siberian especially, I really hate to take a chance on it drying out, so I left a lot of the soil on these so that people didn't feel obligated to get them in the ground right away. Crunch, crunch. Oh, it's still going to have to be the clippers. Sometimes I use my old rusty clippers to do this kind of work. So I have a small hand saw, a garden hand saw. Would, would that harm? No, but it, it's hard to get a good clean cut. So I brought this along. So I, I use this maybe on a peony, although even with a peony, I prefer to use a lopper's. That clean, you know, scissor-like action from a, a pruning shears or a loppers is going to give you, this is going to give you ragged, jagged cuts and 
you know, I use this mainly, uh, even this, well, I didn't bring, I didn't bring my, my real weapon. Uh, when I do pruning, I show uh, a saw that I absolutely love that just two cuts and it's right through the branches. It's a silky saw. But that's another, that's another one you have to be careful because apparently a friend of mine tried it for the first time and didn't realize how, how effective it was because the little greenwood saw, you have to work and it only works on the pull stroke whereas the silky goes both ways and this guy, you know, thought he was going to have to do multiple and two swipes and it went right into his hip. He had a lot of stitches. And so, uh, so there's three little divisions there and will, th will it bloom this year? Hard to say, but Siberians, if they're happy and they really do like a moisture retentive soil, they will grow very nicely in clay soils. And definitely bearded iris don't want anything to do with clay soil. They want really dry, sandy, well-drained soil and full sun, whereas these will take part shade, they'll take moisture. Um, I just think they're much easier to grow. And a lot of them now, I have ones that have four and five inch flowers on them. So they aren't just the little two inch flowers anymore. There's some really neat ones out there. Let's do something really different from that. This is echinacea. And this I am going to try to get. You can tell that this is pretty solid. Unfortunately, the soil was very wet uh, when I was digging. And I live in a wetlands, and I have a lot of clay in my soil. So, And echinacea seeds everywhere for me. Now, one of the things is I have multiple colors of echinacea. And at this time of the year, it's sometimes difficult to tell who's who. If you look at this, and I don't know whether you can see it from a distance, this is distinctly deep pink at the base of the foliage, which tells me it's a pink one. White ones essentially have no color in this base. They're just green all the way down. So I can tell the pink from the white, but I'm not sure I can. I actually have one that has orange leaves on it right now, so I think it may be an orange one. But at least at this time of the year, I can tell the pink from the white if I'm digging them. Sometimes you just have to beat them up a little bit. But again, this is pretty wet. But the good news is that because it is, that means there's no immediacy to get it in the ground. It's going to work for a while. And this one I usually, because I do it in the fall, is very dry and I just use my little snippers. All I have to do is this little one to cut the stems because they're, you know, they're not really big rhizomes. But because this is so wet, I think I'm going to try the knife first. And of course, this I have pictures of, I don't know, 10 different species of butterflies on this plant at one time. It is one of my very best pollinator plants. Well, it looks like it's going to be another one. Oh, this, is a, this knife is a little bit sharper. But again, try not to cut all the way through. Just try to cut through what's called the crown. So just down maybe a half an inch to an inch, and then try to pull apart so that you're saving the roots on you know, the entire plant. This one's a little tougher than I thought it was going to be. Again, it's partly because the soil is so heavy and wet. Come on. Yeah, I guess it's back to the clippers. Again, these are all seedlings, but they, they're just as pretty as the ones I paid money for. Oh, I don't think anyone wants to go home with worms. Well, worms are good. You should want to have lots of worms. <laughs> Whoa, this one really does have a lot of little baby worms in it. They're, they're earthworms, not bug worms or bad guys. All right. So that has, you know, four or five little, again, I would never divide it down to a single piece. You always want a couple together. 
but I never planted this one. It just they just seed all over the place. And this is one I don't mind if it seeds around. Some of my other ones. My, mine tend to bloom most of the summer. Yeah. Um, I don't tend to, at least maybe in the beginning of the summer, you might want to cut, because they start blooming in late June, early July. And if you do deadhead them, then you would be more likely to get more flowers. Come on, Wendy. Uh, but towards the end of the summer, I stop cutting them back, because the goldfinches absolutely love them. And, you know, I have, I'll get a whole flock of male and female goldfinches that are starting to molt, um, you know, visiting my uh, echinacea. So I, I leave them, and then they end up with all the babies all over the place. So there's a trio of those. And, you know, there's still plenty, that, you know, when these leaves come out, that's still going to be a decent clump. But again, don't kill them with kindness. Think of them as growing wild in the prairie. You know, not, you know, doesn't need rich soil, doesn't lead, need mulch. Doesn't mind mulch, but. <laughs> My perennial borders are so thick now that, you know, there's no room to put mulch. It saves me a lot of money. All right, so here's our Solomon seal. And these are just poking up now. And this is a, a rhizome, you know, where those are, were just fibrous rooted perennials. Ooh, that's a bad guy. We don't want him. That looks like a cutworm of some sort. It's called Solomon seal because when the old uh, point comes off, it makes a funny little round spot that apparently they used to think looked like Solomon's seal. So I'm not up on Solomon, so. There are uh, a couple little green things sticking out here. Those are Siberian squill, which is a pretty blue. So I decided not to try to eliminate those. But if you don't want it, then if you see that little green thing, that means that's what it's going to be. My whole back lawn right now is deep blue because of all the Siberian. The chipmunks and the squirrels move them all over the yard. <laughs> all right, let's see. How do I want to cut? Again, I always try to leave a few divisions together. And see, this old, this, this part is old. It does have a bud here that's going to develop, but a lot of this is just, let's see if I can divide this one so you can demonstrate. Sometimes I feel like I'm hurting them, but they don't feel it. <laughs> All right, so I'm actually going to get the soil up this so you can see what it looks like. Oh, I guess I cut off his nose or he broke off. These tend to break apart fairly easily. Oh, it was two different plants. But, you know, this is what's, what is called a rhizome. So it has these funny, long, you know, stems and it just keeps growing and a lot of the other part is all dead. These are pretty when they come out because they're white, pink, and green. This actually still has, the problem with these is if you're planting them up for a plant sale, dig them now because once they start to get taller, you try to plant them and the, you don't want to plant them too deeply. The, the root should only go about half an inch below the soil and then they fall over. Uh, so the, if you get them in right now, they'll make roots and they'll stand up straight in case anyone's going to use them as their donation for the plant sale. Let's How far off is Macadam? Oh, they're, they're pretty strong. Yeah, yeah. I, bought, I bought a couple of new, really interesting, funky ones that have, you know, green leaves with giant white patches in the middle of the leaf and Saw them at the uh, Hosta convention in Philadelphia, and there was one of the gardens that was open was also a nursery. 
So, of course, I had to buy some more plants. <laughs> that, that, that plant I actually put in the ground right away. But again, these have rhizomes crisscrossing over them, but I'm still going to leave them because I think they'll do fine. And there's some nubs coming out of here, so even though it only looks like there's three, there's actually four or five that are going to be coming up in that little group. That's a shade lover. Let's see what we're going to do with the rest of this guy. If there's anyone who just can't stand to see anything go to waste, now well, these really don't have much to offer. I can't believe how wet the soil was when I went out to do these yesterday. I'm glad I didn't wait till today. All right, so I'm going to let somebody take this. There's some above, there's some below. You could pull this apart uh, because there's multiple layers, and when you see it up close, you'll see it has, you know. Uh, oh, this is, guys, looking a little sad. Where's the rest of them? All right, this is the only one that seems to have wilted because the new growth is very soft. This is the Rudbeckia. And this is another one that kind of has rhizomes and spreads around. This also is, the soil in this garden is much drier. So this one I think I may just pull apart. You can see that was very challenging. <laughs> and there are some that are just that easy. Um, this one, if you happen to take it, this is the really tall lemon sort of green coned black eyed, excuse me, Rudbeckia. It's not a black eyed Susan, but same family. But that one um, needs full sun, and I think there's only two, but it should be put in water because it's, it's wilting. I think even if those leaves die, that the plant will survive. All right, who's next? We did Solomon Seal. This is Angelina that I was talking about that's one of my favorites. And I literally go in, grab a handful, pull it out, throw it somewhere else, roots right down. It doesn't look like much right now. I know it's kind of scraggly looking, but it is just, I mean, people always ask about it when they come in the garden. This is one you literally do just pull it apart. And it's, it keeps its foliage year, year round. That's what I love about it, is that it's truly a year round plant. And it loves full sun and very sandy, well drained soil. It doesn't like a, a really good, rich soil. Great front of the border plant. On to my <coughs> daily here. I hope this is Serena Dark Horse. It's always been one of my favorites, but it was kind of out of control here. And again, I want at least two fans. This one happens to be the soil was loose enough that I could literally just pull it apart. I didn't even have to try to cut it up. Daedalus, I, I had to dig up a couple, probably 100 of them last fall due to an invasive plant invasion. And half of them are still just lying on the lawn starting to sprout green, leaves, uh, green foliage. Um, there are probably 50 bags of them in my garage. Bare root. The foliage is kind of yellow right now, so I've got to get them into the sun. But daedalies are, you know, pretty sturdy. You can do almost anything with a daedalie. So when we sell these at plant, uh, garden, uh, daedalie society plant sales, absolute minimum of two fans. So this, each one of these is called a fan. So each one of those should create, uh, produce flowers. Will they, will they flower this year? These should, I would say these will flower this year as long as you get them in the ground fairly soon and you water them. The flower may be somewhat smaller than it normally is because they were dug and transplanted in the spring. My druthers is to do these in August. That's when I tend to dig most of my daedalies and my hostas. That's when I like to do this program too because I know what the variety is because it had flowers on it. <laughs> and despite my best intentions, that just 
you know, labeling. There's just too many to label. Would it be a better idea if you wanted to uh, take some up and divide them for plant sale? Would it be a better idea if you wanted to take some up and divide them for plant sale? Put them in a plastic bag as far as possible and label these stuff? You could. Um, I don't know whether people at plant sales, yeah. you know, the daily people, that's the way they sell them. But or actually, they don't even put them in bags. They just wash off the leaves and you know, you know, put a label around it, and they sell them bare root. But um, uh, hostas. Oh, and one thing on the daedalies I mentioned, you know, prune back the foliage. Hostas do not prune back the foliage. They're totally different. I mean, when you think about a daedalie, you cut off half the daedalie, you still have that the rest of that foliage. When you cut off a hosta. Its primary source of getting chlorophyll or sunlight is on the big part of the leaf. And if you cut off that and just leave the, the you know, little stems, it can't photosynthesize and it's not going to perform well. So even if I break the leaf on a hosta in the fall when I'm digging them, I leave the broken leaf, if it's still attached, as a source of energy. So I never cut off hosta leaves um, when I divide them. So that's Serena Dark Horse. I think I should have left, done, done this one first because it's going to be the toughest. This is my blue cadet that I think is at least 30 years old. This is before I even thought, I, back when I used to think hostas were ugly, but I had a lot of shade and I had to put something over there. And I actually really like it. It, it, it cross-pollinated and made, you do get seedlings. I have lots of hosta seedlings in my garden, too. Um, I, I would say if you don't want hosta seedlings, make sure you deadhead. Another thing is people cut off their flowers when they come into bloom because they think they're ugly. I will never forget the National Daedalee Convention was in our yard back in 2001. We had 500 people from all over the country going through gardens in Massachusetts including mine, and I heard a gentleman who didn't know I was standing next to him that I was the homeowner say, why doesn't she cut the ugly flowers off those hostas? And I turned to him and I said, well, they attract hummingbirds. And he looked at me and he said, hummingbirds only go to red flowers. <laughs> and I decided it wasn't worth correcting him, but I have great pictures of, host of hummingbirds on hosta flowers. It's more about a tubular flower than it is about the color. And, and hummingbirds love hosta flowers. So um, I've got pictures of them sitting on the stems and pictures of them at the flowers. So they really like hosta flowers. And some of the hosta flowers actually are quite pretty now. OK, I'm going to have to be ruthless with this one. <laughs> have you ever eaten hosta leaves? No. I've eaten daedalies, but I've never eaten. Daedalies are very tasty. Raw daedalies, like uh, Happy Returns, um, is, it tastes like sweet lettuce. And at the nursery I work at, you know, the guys seem more willing to try something like that. I guess it proves their manhood or something. <laughs> uh, but you know, I'll say to them you know, something about eating them, because I have an entire cookbook on cooking with daedalies. And if you know, um, oh, what's the? Okay. There's a college in in Providence, and I'm trying to remember that has a culinary school. Johnson and Wales. I grew up in Rhode Island. I can't even remember. Um, Johnson and Wales Culinary School. They do a lot of cooking with uh, daedalie flowers. And when we had the open houses at the nursery in Rehoboth, we used to, you know, have daedalies. Uh, that you can think of it as, as a, a pretty lettuce, and you can stuff them with, um, you know, crab or, um, you know, sometimes they use them with um, sherbet in them, but they really taste like sweet lettuce, and they're higher in vitamin A and C than most of the vegetables you normally eat. So the Chinese grew them in their door side, you know, gardens. Uh, and ate all, all the parts of it, even the roots. But they are very high, very nutritious, and I'll hand a, a guy, you know, a, a petal of 
you know, happy returns or happy returns is one of the better ones. The lighter the color, you know, if it's lemon yellow, they're very sweet. Uh, if you go with the reds or the purples, they have a bit of a bite to them. They're kind of spicy. Uh, but the flowers, and uh, you know, the guy, usually you take out the sex part, but uh, you know, I gave you know I gave one to a guy, and and the look on his face, it was like, can I have another piece? I mean, they're really that good. They really taste like sweet lettuce, but as I said, some are tastier than others. This is this really does look hacked. And there really isn't much of a choice because all the roots start way down here. And that's what happens if you leave them alone for that many years. I'm just going to start getting brutal here. And I think that's my last one. So does anyone have any questions about other kinds of plants that maybe they don't know how to go about? Well, I'm anti-chemical. so. I won't tell you how many I've squished in the last. I mean, that's I usually just every time I see them, I squish them, because most of the things that are going to kill them are going to be bad for our pollinators. If you didn't know ro bare rose and flower, um, and many other products that are systemic insecticides, contain uh, a, pro a product called imidacloprid which is, a neat, and that's what they use for grubs on lawns, too. They now have, I gave a lecture at the, um, sorry, brain freeze. The people that do environmental stuff. Uh, EPA, thank you. At the EPA in Boston, I gave a lecture on planting for pollinators, and they had an entomologist there, their entomologist there, and it was, back when they just were starting to realize how bad neonics were for pollinators. And that's what imidacloprid is a neonic. They now know that when you use it, it stays in the plant roots for five or six years. And it is transferred into the pollen and the nectar. And they now know that one of the reasons that bee hives are struggling is when they consume the nectar or the pollen from the neonic treated plant, they lose their ability to find their way back to the hive. And it's, it's killing butterflies, bees, and even hummingbirds because they're all getting the neonics. So, you know, try to read labels and try to avoid anything that has imidacloprid or uh, neonicotinoids, as they're called, or neonics for short, because they are really taking a toll on our pollinators. And, and watch out for Roundup. I do not use Roundup spray, and I haven't actually for a long time. I, it's just I have too many plants too close to each other, which is the primary reason. But I will still use Roundup for one purpose, and I probably will never give it up. My whole, when we moved in 40 years ago, we had essentially a few native trees <coughs> and just about every plant that is now listed as an invasive species. And I am still dealing with acres of invasive species in my yard. And woody invasives, the best way to treat them is in the fall. Like, I had a bittersweet <coughs> vine that had five trunks that big around that went 50 feet up my cherry tree. It was a wild cherry, and it killed the tree. And I went in in October. I cut it right down to that tall. Concentrated Roundup, not, you know, diluted, but concentrated Roundup. Pour, I put on two pairs of gloves. I put on a plastic pair underneath a pair like this, and you buy the little sponge brush, paint brushes, and I pour the concentrated Roundup in a glass container, and I dip the sponge brush into the concentrated Roundup and immediately paint the surface of the trunk that's you know only one or two inches tall. It needs to be done within a, a minute or two. There is not one sign of life on that bittersweet that went all the way up 
this tree. And I've done it for burning bushes that were on the property, you know, wild ones when we moved in. I've done it on honeysuckle bushes that are also on the invasive plant list. I've done it on Norway maple seedlings that show up in my yard all the time, even though I don't have Norway maples. It's incredibly effective, especially in the fall, because in the fall, all the, all the plants are drawing all the moisture and nutrients into their root system, so everything's going down. In the spring, everything's going up. So it's much less effective in the spring, but it is really, that's what they're using in all the conservation areas now, too, to try to get rid of invasive species, woody invasive species. So I'm very careful with it, but I've attended multiple symposiums at UConn about invasive plants, and that is what people are doing to, you know, so glyphosate is a bad thing, but invasive plants are maybe even worse. Oh, I'm sure. And I mean, you just hear about children that are crawling around the grass that you feed with all this crap. Yeah, be very, very careful. Of course, the trend now is just to have less lawn and, you know, grow meadows. I don't know whether I'm a meadow person. I have a lot of grass, but I don't, uh, it's mostly violets and uh, a lot of weeds. So I, kn I don't know whether you're going to do the raffle after you have your business meeting or you have a flower show. But I'd be happy to answer questions. I'll stick around a little while. I have a husband who just came home from the hospital this afternoon after open heart surgery, so that's why I was running a little late because I had to t get him out of the hospital and home. Uh, but thank you.